This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Hey, everybody. I am super excited. My guest today is the one and only Tim Sanders. How are you, Tim? I'm great, David. Nice to talk to you, bro. Well, it's great to talk to you. And you're on the road. You are in the middle of book launch hell. And we (laughs) well know what that is. It's wonderful. It's amazing. But it's all about deal storming, which is your new book. And um, first question for you is, because I read the book, I love the book, I've got my little post-it notes, I got some specific I questions. You mentioned that Chris Brogan encouraged you to write this book or write a book around sales leadership. Take us back to that moment. What was that all about? What was that conversation and what made you believe a crazy person like Chris? It's true, dude. It's Chris Brogan's fault. This whole project is on him. <laughs> So this goes back to, I believe it was June of 2013, and I was speaking at the Cisco Partner Summit in Boston. It's an event Cisco does every year for their thousands of bars. And Chris, of course, lives in Boston, and he and I have been, you know, bros with a bromance going for years. I just, you know, we just dig each other's philosophy. So he took me out to dinner at the Legal Seafood Test Kitchen, which is the bomb, right? So anyway, we're having dinner, and he's like, well, what's your next book? And I start riffing on, well, I think I'm going to do the follow-up to Love is the Killer app, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. And he goes, well, what are you doing now besides speaking? And I go, well, you know, I'm kind of wrapping up this eight-year stint of doing big deal hunting consulting for companies. You know, that's what I did at Yahoo. And after Yahoo, as I met companies, they'd tell me, oh, we've got this deal stuck in the pipeline. And I'd say, hey, I've got this gadget play that I built at Yahoo called Deal Storming. Let me build one for you and, and you can scale it, I promise. And I said, that's what I've been doing. I said, dude, it's not interesting like, you know, the abundance mentality or today we are rich or it's not inspiring. So I haven't really thought of it as a book. It's actually quite boring. And Chris like puts down his fork and he says, are you crazy, man? He said, if you can help companies get deals unstuck or save big accounts that are in danger, he goes, that's a book. He goes, I know you won't get standing ovations or make people weep openly when you tell your speech. He goes, but this is something I would actually read. And I was like, you think? And so it's so interesting, you know, David, there's an analogy in consulting that we have. We say um, a lot of times we're like a fish in a fishbowl. If you walk past us and asked us, how's the water? We would ask you, what's water? So sometimes you just don't notice the real book inside you. So anyway, after he talked, I I went and talked to a lot of my clients. And by the way, my consulting clients over that eight-year stint ranged from television networks to software companies, defense contractors. And I helped them all work on big deals or save big accounts. And I went back and I said, this NDA we signed, do you think we could just loosen it up a tad bit? I want to write a book. And so we did a lot of wrangling and I went to the publishing world in New York and Penguin Portfolio confirmed Chris's belief that yes, this is a book that the leadership would love to read. Sales innovation is a real priority in this complicated world we do business in. So here we are a couple of years later, deal storming's out on the market and ready for sale. That is so funny. And you know what? You're such a master storyteller. I'm not sure if people will be crying necessarily, but you will get standing ovations. I don't know about the crying, but the standing ovations for sure. So I'll tell you, you know, like you, I'm a book fiend. I read, you know, zillions of books. I don't think I've ever read as detailed and as specific. I mean, you give the blow by blow ground game of how to make this deal storming happen. A lot of people would say, well, deal storming and sales culture and get everyone around the table. And you're like, no, 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 dude, there's four phases. There's seven steps. There's four kinds of stakeholders. There's boom, boom, boom. Here's how to have the meeting. Here's the before. Here's the during. Here's the after. You've got the whole thing. So let's dig into that for a minute. Well, let me say one thing real quick. Too, yeah. Because that's the same thing my publisher said when I turned in the book. You know, so two things they said was like, wow, you've revealed everything. And second of all, even the names of the people in the accounts, you've revealed everything. I mean, you can imagine the publisher got kind of nervous on both fronts, right? So nervous for me and my consulting business and equally nervous for, as you can tell from reading the book, dozens and dozens of individual sales reps and leaders who gave me some skinny, you know, what was going on. And, you know, what I would tell other authors is that if you decide to wind down a consulting business, 
then you wind it down the whole way, not part of the way, right? So the reason so many sales or marketing books are rather general, to be honest with you, is the consultant wants to create the appetite but not serve the meal, right? Because if you tell everybody 100% of the process, why in the world would they hire you? Right. So when I wrote this book, I wrote it with the philosophy that I would prefer to speak, write, and give free advice moving forward than to continue the consultancy for a variety of reasons. So I decided in the book, I would tell all of it. So after you read Deal Storming, you have no need to ever hire Tim Sanders to be your consultant. And of course, David, you know, I'm going through some drama, you can imagine, with the deep reveals in the book. But, you know, my publisher said, I want a book that's a page turner. That's not one of those. I had a friend 15 years ago at a fictitious company. Kind of right. Books. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So one of the things that you mentioned, and this is true for everybody, I mean, any size company, whether you're a solopreneur or a Fortune 100 company, you say, you know, it's getting tougher out there. It's absolutely getting tougher out there. Buyers are smarter. There's a lot more cynicism. There's a lot more buyer education. And you have a statistic in the book that we're going through about 60% of the buying cycle before we ever even talk to a salesperson for the first time. Mm -hmm. And then I love what you also have here around the four levels of the sale, right? So it's contact, conceive, convince, and contract. How does all of that complexity and how do those four levels impact what we need to do as sales professionals? So here's the high point. Whatever you sell, if you sell business to business or high dollar business to individual, the transition over the last 30 years has gone from selling belly to belly, from selling salesperson to community. Because when I started out, I sold radio and I sold to a mom or a mom and a pop or a mom and a pop and a wise son. And that was about it. And you saw them face to face. You could take these closing techniques straight out of Glen Gary, Glen Ross, and you could slam people shut. And then over the course of the years, buyers got smarter and they realized that if they buy on their own, they get beat. And so to quote Jeffrey Toole in Mastering the Complex Sale, They begin to organize, they begin to mobilize, they begin to diversify the buying chain, do their own online research. Companies have developed procurement departments. And then the other thing, David, is that what we sell is so multi-pronged in its technology, it's involving more people on the other side. So, you know, today, like in the training world, you don't just sell a videotape that you're going to put in a, you know, package and mail to somebody. You're selling an online video training program with the back-end assessment and real-time reporting. And all of a sudden, the prospect has an HR lead, a field trainer, an IT director, a finance manager, and everybody weighing in on the sale. And then the worst part is the primary decision maker in HR is now going on Google and comparing what you're saying to what the truth is. And so it's created these complexity layers throughout the levels of the sale. Now let's talk about those four levels. This is an important part of my consulting work for years and years because, you know, the premise of the book is that sales should create multidisciplinary, multidepartmental teams to win deals. And that means we have to teach folks in other departments how our world works. So I had to come up with an analogy that made sense to whoever you are, whether you're sales, distribution, service, marketing, operations, supply chain, doesn't matter, you're going to get this. Winning a deal is like getting to the top of a video game. There's levels. Oh my goodness. And I love the video game analogies in the book. So I'm a total old school gamer. And now again, maybe not everyone who reads the book is an old school gamer like you and me, but all the Atari, all the Nintendo, all the old school, you know, arcade games like, you know, it used to be Pong. It used to be Space Invaders. And now it's like Halo 5 in 3D coming at your head. It's a multiplayer, multi-level, highly complex game. So the first level of the sale is contact. Not just finding the decision makers, but the decision makers defining the influence map and finding the informers that can give you an inside scoop on the pain. If you get through that level and you know you've gotten through it because you now have the influence map in front of you, you have enough grist to understand the pain, you go to the second level where you try to conceive the deal. And here's what's important. For most companies in B2B, you don't have a product or a service. Your company has a suite of capabilities, an emphasis that so many companies today, David, is cross-selling. So really, I think that the modern salesperson is a chef, and their job is to conceive the perfect recipe that solves the pain. Inside software as service world, there's this saying, and I believe this, don't be a supplement, be a painkiller, right? 
Because as Brent Adamson, my new buddy at CEB, likes to say, we don't sell a product or a service. We sell change. And our, our competition is the status quo. So you have to conceive the recipe that solves the hunger they can't go with one more day. And that's hard because you got to get the information. You got to deeply understand your products and services capabilities. You may have to understand your supply chain's role in all of this. So once you conceive of that win-win deal and you feel like it's demonstrative, then you enter the third level of the sale. This is the one most sales books spend the time on. That's convince. And that's where you convince the prospect or the existing customer that there's a pain that only you can solve and that every day they go without doing business with you, the pain just gets bigger. And you don't just have to convince the ones you talk to, you have to convince the ones that they'll talk to when you're never around, which puts more pressure on you to be innovative in the devices you use to demonstrate your unique selling proposition. If you get through the convince phase and the decision makers and the sign-offs and the influencers are all on board, you encounter a brand new set of obstacles called the legal department. And that's when you enter the contract phase where you creatively have to find the middle between how they do business and how you do business. And by the way, time is not on your side. If you take too long to get through one of these levels, there may be an acquisition, a merger, a change in the market space, a new competitor that says, what are you talking about? I'll do it free. And you level all the way back down like in a video game, tick tock, tick tock. You've only got so many lives before the game is over. Right, exactly. What I'll tell you, when you talk about creatively, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep repitching how awesome this book is. Thank you, David. One thing that I love is that even some of the references and some of the books and some of the experts that you're quoting they're not necessarily sales experts. Right. You rely very heavily on innovation and creativity because this is a completely new way to reimagine sales and the sales process. And more importantly, the buying process right. and how we can tap into that using the creativity of many, many stakeholders within our sales organization. So I love the fact that you've tapped into the world of innovation and creativity. And here's another compliment. I'm, I'm not just blowing smoke. This is a true compliment. There's so many unoriginal sales books that are just kind of a rehash. Oh, I've heard that before. I've seen that before. Ah, I've been around the block, my friend. I haven't heard or seen much of this anywhere. So when you say full open kimono and just give them everything they need to be successful, it's like the old spaghetti sauce commercial. It's in here. It's Thank in you. here. Let's talk a little bit about creativity because, you know, you yeah. and I, we have a lot of passion for that. So I wanted to write a book that was just as interesting to marketing as it is to sales. Because as you know from the book, I believe marketing is sales' most important partner. It's funny, marketing seems to be one of my biggest markets for this book because the marketing group says, you know what, this whole internal customer philosophy sucks. I mean, marketing's not the land of slow. We don't you know, call marketing and say, I need new collateral. Why aren't your ads giving me more lead gen? That's a horrible relationship. MHI Global did research on the world-class sales organization that beats their competitors by 20%. And the one thing they all had in common was conscious collaboration across departments in pursuit of the big deals that defined their culture. But what's interesting in the study is that the world-class sales organization was three times more likely than the average to have a high alignment with marketing and sales, where if you talk to marketing and say, you know, are you a service provider or a partner to sales? And they'd say, we're right there at the table with them at the beginning of all the important stuff. They look directly to us and ask, what's the voice of the customer? And when they get voice of the customer, they give it to us in real time. They invite us into Salesforce, et cetera, et cetera. So I believe for the marketers out there, deal storming is just as much about you as it is sales because the winning companies are truly marketing and sales driven. The reason I spend so much time on creativity and innovation is because you know, the complexity of sales is driven in part by the increasing tolerance of the prospect for every device we ever come up with to sell them. Whether it's a new way to illustrate our value proposition, a, a clever new way for us to make contact like social selling. It's just like the lifespan of each one of these techniques is like dropping daily and daily. What does that mean? It means we have to harness the power of creativity. I don't want to go Sheldon, Big Bang Theory here, but if you know me, you know that I'm like obsessed with etymology. So like creativity is defined by most as one's ability to produce original and unexpected work that is at the same time appropriate to the situation, which makes sense. Because if you think about innovation, innovation is one's ability to get a solution into the market. 
right? So it's really about what can you do that's original and unexpected, but you know for a fact it's appropriate, and how do you execute that to get it into the market? Because I believe that for organizations, marketing and sales driven, rapid problem solving is the only sustainable competitive advantage in this complex world we do business in. Well, and at the beginning of the book, I want to I take you back to something that's towards the end of the book. But at the beginning of the book, you have that great uh, quote from Disney that uh, a successful movie is a thousand problems solved. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that that's the analogy to a complex sale, that a successful complex sale is a thousand problems solved also. Yeah, and and I've kind of thought about that a lot more. Uh, Of course, I'm on the lecture circuit now giving a talk every day on this. And yesterday I was at the World Leaders Conference in Palm Beach. And when the interview, they were talking to me about that. And they said, well, you know, why is that an important point? And I said, here's the issue. The worst way to end a meeting is to say, this is all great. I'm going to take it under advisement. Let's have another meeting because let's have another meeting as a failure. If rapid problem solving is the competitive advantage in business, then that means every deal storming meeting should set the next best play. And if you have a philosophy that there's no eureka moment that saves the day, no Samantha bewitched moment that breaks the account open, if you understand that progress in sales and marketing is one little solution at the time, then you're going to free yourself from the shackles of divine inspiration. And you're just going to be in a meeting saying, okay, next best play, let's go get Nielsen to do a third-party piece of research on our ad effectiveness. So we go back to the customer and say, forget our internal case studies and all of your trust issues. Here's what Nielsen says. That's the next best play. Is that a big idea? Not necessarily, but it's going to help us progress. And David, it makes me think about something I was reminded of recently, Coach K at Duke. When somebody says, like, what makes Coach K, Coach K? You could talk about a lot of things, but it's his style, right? So there's two words he says to his kids that helps him forget the last awful play and how they're going to score 20 points in five minutes to catch up or how they're going to have to do a two-second left half-court play. And he says these two words all the time. He says, next play. Because if you coach people to not start with the end in mind, just focus on the next play, then much like Pixar did trying to make Toy Story, you just cycle through the hundred or thousand problems that stand between you and the done deal or the saved account. Absolutely. And one problem at a time. So, man, I mean, we could talk about this for hours. I have just two other things that I have to ask you about because they're so awesome Number one is a lot of people say, well, you know, we work on the occasional big deal and that's great. But you tell a very compelling story in here about losing a big client and how deal storming was used to reacquire really a pivotal client relationship that was worth a lot of money. So if people say, well, you know, we have a a couple of big clients and we don't sell a whole lot more. The question is, well, what would happen if you lost one Mm. of those key accounts and lost one of those whales? Will this book help? And the answer is, oh, my God, it will totally help. And that was a rocky road. You know, I I love the way that you share that story that you think, oh, well, let's get these guys together and let's just have them talk. And the guy's like, "Uh, no, I don't want to meet with the guy. I have no interest, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it was a real world courting and leveraging all the players and, um, the mentor, right? The inside mentor. Oh, yeah. Is one of the key principles there towards the end of the book. Talk about what that means when you're either hunting a big sale or when you're looking to save a big sale that just left the building. So, the beginning of my consulting was about big deal hunting, and the end of my consulting was about big deal saving. Right, um, exactly. It's all the same thing. It's a bunch of, it's about problem solving. So, when you are stuck in the pipeline or when your biggest account's been poached or you have a big disagreement with your account, like in the book, there's, there's reasons, like you raise your price or you do something they don't like, sometimes the team you put together inside your company isn't big enough. And for those watching this interview that have a small firm, the deal mentor is really important because I've seen architectural firm with four employees use deal storming to win their biggest deal. I've seen a consulting firm with six employees use deal storming to save the account that was 50% of their annual income. So this stuff works. It's about building a team of people that have a stake in the deal or expertise about your problem. And so in many situations, you can find a deal mentor. Now, this might be a person inside the prospect that really likes you. I mean, they like your company. They like what you do. They're not the decision maker, but they have a passion for you to do business with them. They think you're important and they can give you the lay of the land. They can mentor you on what lies in front of you or tell you where the private pain lives. But in certain situations, David, you can find a mentor out in the market. 
You might find them via LinkedIn. They might have already sold to this company. They might have expertise in this particular industry vertical, or they might know something about your sticking point. Meaning, let's say you sell some kind of piece of technology and you're stuck at the front door of the chief information security officer at your big whale you're trying to land. You're a little company, you go on LinkedIn and you ask, has anybody ever been stuck with security clearance on something so simple as a IT training program? And you'd be surprised you have friends that said, oh, oh, this is David over here. You know, in Philly, I did this three years ago. Let me coach you on this. That's what I mean by mentorship. In certain situations inside companies, you'll find another account executive or a senior executive who's been through this before and they can act as your mentor. The idea here is when you put together a deal storming team, you ask yourself who knows something about this problem and don't constrain yourself to the people inside your company. Last caveat. If you're recruiting a deal mentor from your prospect, remember one thing. You never want them to be embarrassed for advocating you. You never want their job security to be compromised for educating you. So please be careful. Be very transparent with them. Protect them as you move forward in the deal. And always, always, David, brief them on everything about your products and services so that if they do try to advocate for you, they don't look bad in doing so. Absolutely. I love that. Well, so let's talk about where people can get their hands on this fabulous book. Obviously, it's in all the major bookstores, online, offline. It's also, are we still doing the bonuses on your website? So just go to dealstorming.net, dealstorming.net. And if you buy a book, you get a two hour video training boot camp, and you also get an ebook called Relationship Power, which is my follow-up on Love is the Killer app. In specific, it talks about how to be a great mentor and how to be a 21st century networker extraordinaire. So go to dealstorming.net. Dealstorming.net. And I would go there right now, except I already went there. I already (laughs) got my downloads and my goodies, and they're fantastic. Thank you so much. So Tim, this is awesome. We are just going to promote the heck out of this fantastic book. And I'll tell you, it, it really is one of the top Uh, in my opinion, one of the top five sales books ever. And it's not like fifth or third. It's not that. It's different topics. Right. So there is, you know, if there's a great cold calling books, there's great books on web research, there's great books on sales presentations. This is the greatest book on collaborative selling, period, end of sentence, bar none, game over. So thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time.